Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Jay. I'm with Passions North, and we're talking about the masks we wear tonight. I'm going to take a moment here to actually drop my mask for a moment, and I'm going to confess something to you all. Um, you look like a very receptive group of people, and uh, I feel very comfortable doing that. Is that I am very nervous tonight, and as such, I am very likely going to goof up my words and probably get lost in my speech. So I hope you'll be very patient with me tonight. Um, and we will find some amazing insights in here, I'm sure. So, I thought I'd open tonight with a bit of a joke um, from the Canadian comedian named Norm Macdonald. I'm sure it's a very famous name around town. Uh, and that is, a moth walked into a podiatrist's office. Uh, the doctor looks at him and he says, so what's wrong? The moth looks at him and he says, man, where do I start? Uh, I get up in the morning, I go to work, I don't even know why I'm going anymore. I feel like, like there's no reason for me to be there, like I'm just putting in time. My boss, he, he looks at me and I don't even think he likes me anymore. And man, I woke up at 3 a.m. last night and I'm lying next to my wife and I looked at her and I'm like, I don't even know who this person is anymore. And this is a woman I fell in love with. And my daughter, oh, my daughter's gonna be 25 next week. It seems like yesterday she was just four years old. And my son, I don't talk to him anymore. I used to take him to every hockey game, but I don't talk to him anymore. It's, it's, it's crazy. And some days I don't even feel like a moth. Some days I feel like a spider. And I'm just, I'm just holding on to my, my web in a windstorm, you know? It's, it's, it's crazy. But I just looks at him and he says, man, wow, you've got some really heavy stuff going on. You should be talking to a counselor or a psychiatrist or something. Why on earth would you come to a podiatrist? The moth looks back at him and he says, well, the light was on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How many of us have ever felt that way? Like we're just going through life and the light is on. Yeah, I, I felt like that a lot in my life. Um, I used to wake up in the morning and I used to just dread what it was going to be like that day. Uh, I used to work at a call center. I used to work in technical support. Um, has anybody ever called tech support? Is, you know what kind of people call tech support? Angry people. Frustrated people. People who think they know what they're talking about, but really haven't got a clue. Yeah. It was a place that thrived on negativity, and it was very depressing to work there. But the pay was good, so the light was on. So I would show up every day. Um, and at the time, I, I really didn't know who I was. I, I didn't know where I was going. I mean, I had done everything right. Everything that I was told to do as a, as a teenager growing up in high school, I had gone to university. I was a university graduate. I was a husband. I was a father. I still am a father. I haven't killed him yet. Um, and, you know, it, it was a breadwinner. I had a stable career. But I wasn't happy. I wasn't excited about life. And I didn't know why. Well, what was happening was I was wearing a mask. I was customer service J. I was the guy that could handle every customer service problem that you could handle my plate. I had 20 agents that I was managing flawlessly, absolutely perfectly. There wasn't a question I couldn't answer, and I was the technical support guy that you wanted to get on the phone, because I knew it all. Yeah, right. I also happened to be a dad. I was supporting two kids, uh, and I had all the answers for the family, too. Um, it, was, uh, it was the guy that quarterbacked the family team. That was me. And I was the one that they would look to when the bad stuff happened. I was that guy. And the one thing that scared the hell out of me was that someday somebody was going to wake up and find out I didn't know anything. I didn't know a damn thing about what was coming. And on top of that, I used to be up at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning trying to plan it out. Has anybody been up in total anxiety trying to plan out your life at 3 o'clock in the morning? The internet is a wonderful tool for that, I have to say. So there were a lot of different masks that we all wear in this world, and we see them in a lot of different ways, especially in the stereotypes that we tend to assign people. 
In my case, I wore the mask that uh, of someone who never showed fear, I always knew what to do, always had the answers. I had a plan for every occasion, and that was far from the truth. And there are others out there. There's like the gamer geek folks. Is anybody a gamer geek like me? Anybody? Yeah, right on. One, awesome. <laughs> We're in a bookstore. How many bookworms do we have? Yeah, excellent. Right on. Any party animals? Come on, you know where you are. Party <laughs> awesome. Awesome. How about a granola hipster type? Anybody got? They got that uh, that hips, hipster thing going on. No, maybe that's maybe that's like last year. Okay, never mind. <laughs> so, what are some of the masks you have seen? Anybody? Some of the masks that you have seen. The, the people that you walk down the street and just you know who that guy is because you recognize that mask. Have you ever seen that? Anybody? No. Okay, that's a question that I'll take out of the speech. No problem. <laughs> Well, the mask that I was wearing was slowly killing me. Not physically, but emotionally. I didn't even know that I was wearing a mask at the time. I just knew that something wasn't right. Um, and as it turns out, the reason I wasn't happy was because I wasn't being who I truly was. I had been wearing the mask for so long that I had gotten lost in all the roles that I had played. Uh, so I started a very slow but amazing process in discovering who I was. So where does the mask come from? Well, it's actually a construction of the rules and things that happen to us when we grow up. It's like a piece of armor. It's designed to keep us safe and to keep our vulnerable selves from being shown to anybody. Um, and it develops as our personalities develop. So personality actually begins before you were born. Do you know that? Before you're born, the persistent feelings that exist in, this, in the environment that you are, are conceived in and that you are gestated in are what give rise to the beginnings of your personality. And this is a very fascinating uh, study that I read about uh, survivors from the, uh, the, the Battle of Britain. A lot of the folks that were born during the Battle of Britain have unexplained anxiety issues, and unexplained uh, claustrophobia issues from hiding in bunkers and always being frightened that there was a bomb going to land on them. For myself, um, for myself, my mom was pregnant, uh, obviously. Um, <laughs> but my dad ran a service station. And money was pretty tight. Uh, I have to say that my dad worked a lot of hours. Uh, I hear stories about it to this day. Uh, 40 feet of snow always seems to come up. Uh, and they were both worried about money. Always, and they constantly fought about it. So guess what I grew up with? I grew up with a constant anxiety, constantly in my life. I didn't know why. I'm, I'm sure I was the most stressed out two-year-old that ever existed. Um, so that is the first instance of personality development. The next one comes as we're growing up. And uh, I have a little dim, uh, uh, chart here. I'm not sure if you can see it, but I'm gonna try and bring it forward. This is called personality amoeba. And as you can see, we start out as a little happy self, and we want to grow outwards. Assuming everything stays the same, we continue to grow, and everything's happy. So we start to learn our behaviors. For example, when uh, baby is hungry, baby cries. Mom comes and feeds baby, baby's happy again and life goes on, it's very happy. But then something happens. Baby is hungry, baby cries, mom doesn't come right away. Maybe mom is sleeping, maybe mom is distracted by something. So baby must decide to change behaviors. Baby has discovered that itself, of, its own, of, it, of itself, is no longer enough to get its needs met, so it has to do something. Maybe it cries louder, maybe it gets silent, there's nothing scarier as a parent than hearing your child screaming and then suddenly going silent. But then mom comes along and feeds baby again, so baby's needs are met. So baby's personality has changed. It has decided that it has to be something in order to have its needs met. That's a pretty heavy thing to put on a baby, isn't it?
So emotional wounds happen. And these, these are the emotional wounds. They happen any time we inflict a condition, either intentionally or unintentionally, on a child. Not all emotional wounds are bad, so if you didn't feed your child quick enough, it's not going to smart, scar them for life. But, for example, some of the rules, or some of the, uh, the uh, things that happen, like a uh, baby touching a hot stove, is a good thing, because baby doesn't want to touch a hot stove, because hot stoves are hot. And so baby learns not to touch them again. Others are harmful, such as playground bullying, being lost, being abandoned. Um, and those experiences can create behaviors that help a child, uh, and then later an adult, learn how to protect themselves. For example, uh, a mom, for, for example, if she was lost or abandoned as a child, might be overly and, and very hyper-vigilant about their own children's well-being. As adults, our wounds hide. Our, our wounds are hidden by the mask. And so these red areas are effectively the mask. They are a... Uh, we cover over them with a combination of strategies and beliefs that create the illusion of a whole person. The mask keeps us from showing our vulnerability to anyone. And when challenged, we deploy defensive strategies, such as getting angry, such as getting quiet, such as hiding. Does anyone here, does that sound familiar to anybody? I used to hide. I used to hide, I used to sit way in the back of every assembly at school, I used to hide all the time. Things have changed. Another factor in our personality uh, that affects our personality is our families of origin. And this is very different from the wounds that we incur as children, but it looks very similar. The factor involves rules and the family rules that have been passed down from generation to generation. This is called intergenerational pain. Um, these rules are about how the family governs itself and how it functions as a unit. The rules that we're told can be told to us directly, such as never talk to Uncle Al because Uncle Al has gone through the war and we never want to talk about the war with Uncle Al. He just doesn't want to experience it again. That would be an, uh, an over rule. Other rules are more coverted, such as never talk to yourself. Or if you're caught talking to yourself, you're going to get in trouble. Why? Because Cousin Willie was a schizophrenic and talked to himself all the time and then ended up killing himself and that hurt the family badly. So we never talked to him. In my family, we had several of these rules. And so it's very important to look at your family history. Who is the black sheep in your family would be a question you might want to ask. Why are they that black sheep? Did they do something wrong? Or is it just something everybody knew or assigned that person? Are there any heroes in your family? Are they used as an example for you to live up to? How was your culture viewed in society, especially our society? Were they persecuted? Were they subjugated? Were they elevated? Were they privileged? What are the gender roles in your family? Who's in charge, men or women? What are the spiritual beliefs in your family? Did you have spiritual beliefs? My grandfather fought in World War I. He was given the choice to fight or be executed. Pretty simple choice, if you ask me. Thankfully, he chose correctly. In his first engagement, he was taken prisoner by the Russians and sent to a prison camp in Siberia. It was uh, a very difficult time for my family back then. When the war was over, the Russians released all of their prisoners, thankfully, and he had to walk from central Siberia to central Ukraine, which is an epic and difficult journey. Once he got home, he discovered that the Russians who had taken over the Ukraine at that time started to appropriate food from them and created an artificial famine. He then shortly, shortly thereafter decided to move his family to Canada. So there's a lot of rules in my family that came from that history. In particular, at my family, um, we have to clean our plates when we're having dinner. Plates have to be absolutely clean. We cannot waste food under any circumstances. We were also, no, oh, I'm sorry. We were the family that, uh, that you could visit and you would have to be fed. It was just, you were always fed if you visited. We'd also take in a lot of strays. 
dogs, cats, people. My brother had people that lived with us. His friends lived with us. My mom had a friend live with us. My sister's now husband lived with us for a little while. And when you live in a three bedroom trailer with seven people, things are pretty tight. Women were in charge of my family. We were a matriarchy. And that was because the men could be taken away at any time and sent to war and may not come back. So men couldn't be counted on. My grandfather also walked back from a prison camp in Siberia and then went ahead to Canada and set up a homestead. No small feat back in that time. This is about 1910. Uh, so every man thereafter has been held up to that particular example as, as the level of sacrifice and dedication you have to your family. So now with personality development, where does the mass begin? Well, our wounds dictate what we need in order to avoid the pain and trauma that created them. And those behaviors become our masks. As you can tell, I'm not an artist. On the surface is our mask. These are the behaviors that we taught ourselves from childhood, through childhood, through our family systems. It makes a presentable version of the self to the outside world. It is designed to keep us safe. It is designed to keep us from feeling vulnerable. This is called our inauthentic self. And it can change from situation to situation. The mask serves the purpose of protecting us from being hurt in the ways that we once were. It is a construction of our ego. Now, when I say the word ego, I know some of us think of this person who is very full of themselves, very uh, self-centered, very, uh, I'm going to say Donald Trump-like. You don't have to laugh, it's okay. The ego is actually a little voice inside of us that tells us whether or not we're doing something right in order to protect ourselves or whether we're doing something risky. Okay? Um, it's a little voice inside me that said, Jay, you better have all the answers. You better know what the hell you're talking about or someone that you care about deeply is going to suffer. That's my little voice. Once we get to peek under the mask, we find ourselves a layer of anger. That's our defense mechanism. That is the reaction when somebody tells us, I don't believe what you're selling me. Oh yeah, you wanna, you wanna argue about that? For me, it was I would, I would hide in the back, and when I couldn't hide in the back, I'd get very defensive about what I was trying to portray. So if I was a person who always had to have the answers and someone questioned me, I would get argumentative about it. i get very argumentative about it. And I would argue it very intensely. My positions were never flexible. They were completely and totally stoic. Um, and even more so, if I didn't know something and somebody did happen to prove I was wrong, Three o'clock in the morning, I'm on the internet or reading a book or trying to figure out just why the heck he knew something that I didn't know. Like I said, the internet is a wonderful invention, except at three o'clock in the morning. Under the anger, we have fear. And that is the fear about what would be happen, what would happen if I didn't have all the answers. It's the question that asks, if you knew me, the real me, you might not like me. For me, this was a suspicion that I didn't know at all. I mean, shocker, right? I don't know at all? What, are you kidding me? Really? No, I don't know at all. It was a fear that I wouldn't be good enough to handle what the world threw at me. I had two little kids. I had a wife to look after. I was terrified that I would lose it all because I didn't know how to manage what life hit. My belief that I wasn't good enough, wasn't strong enough, wasn't resourceful enough gave rise to a person with chronic anxiety and suppressed anger. Anxiety because no matter how hard I tried to prepare, there was no way to prepare for the unknown. And anger because if I wasn't prepared for the unknown, someone I cared about would suffer. Someone I cared about deeply. And that led me into a depression for over 15 years. It's a pretty dark place. Not a fun place to be, I can assure you. So what changed? 
why did it take 15 years for me to send in the crash? Why didn't I just turn it around tomorrow? Well, as Tony Robbins once said, people will always do more to avoid pain than to gain pleasure. More importantly, people will do more to avoid the fear of pain than to pursue happiness and joy. Once I decided that avoiding pain was no longer possible, I started to explore the dark sides to myself. I started to look at the pieces of me that I didn't want to see. It was the scariest thing I'd ever done in my life. I started to learn that the anxiety that I was experiencing since I was small wasn't actually mine. And I started to unlearn. I started to learn techniques on how to manage that anxiety. I'm a great meditator. It was my go, but it was my go-to reaction. Whenever something happened in my childhood, instantly into anxiety, into, into a little ball, into a little hidden guy sitting in corners. I also learned that my family reinforced this thought of being prepared for anything. I mean, we had basically gone through a famine and a war in a very short time. How can you be prepared for that? My family's rules, be prepared for anything. So through a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy, um, I learned that so far to date, I've handled everything that I have thrown at me. I have a 100% success rate. Thank you. And. Well, I may not have succeeded at everything I've tried, I've managed to become successful in surviving what's come my way. When that happened, and when that belief started to settle in me that I was good enough, that I, I did survive all these crazy things that have happened in my life, the mask started to disappear. I started to shed the mask. And now I stand up in front of you 100% authentically me. But that wasn't the best part of the journey. The best part of the journey was what happened, what I discovered in the fact that while I was learning to prepare for the unknown, I developed a skill for finding resources and doing research that absolutely is a gift to me now. There isn't a topic that I can't figure out and that I can't handle. And it is thanks to the fact that I was terrified one time of being afraid of the unknown. The most amazing part of the journey is not what happened, is not necessarily, not the gifts that I got, but actually what happened to that anger that I had underneath it, because anger didn't go away. What it did is it turned from its role in defending my false belief about not being good enough, and it became, a, it started to engage into the things that I truly cared about, like helping others find this work, helping others find their false belief. It became my passion. I discovered this in a book called The Passion Test, which I just happened to bring here, and we just happened to be standing in a bookstore that carries it. <laughs> Amazing. I read this book when I started working at the call center, back when people were yelling at me a lot. And it was, something, it was a book that started to help me figure out what my passions were in life. Um, and where I started to finally start seeing pieces of my identity. Today, as I've done counseling, and I'm a counselor, and I've, I've done a lot more of my life worked out, I've discovered that passions are, in fact, keystones to who you are. After all, they are the things that you love. They are the things you love to do. They are the people that you love. More importantly, they are the things that you are really ticked off about. And I say that with a little bit of irony, because the things that you are ticked off about are actually the things that you are most passionate about. And I'll give you an example. A person who may be very angry, and I see this on social media a lot, a person who's very angry about some social injustice that's happening, has the choice of remaining angry about it, or they can become passionate and become an advocate for changing that social injustice. And when that happens, that is where the magic really lies. And that is where the excitement comes from. Now, we all play different roles in life. I, and obviously I'm not going to go home tonight, and I'm not going to stand up in front of my kids and give them a, a lecture on masks. So, what is the difference between a role because obviously I play a, a manager, I play a counselor, and I am also a father. What is the difference between a role and a mask? Well, a mask hides who you really are. 
it hides the parts of you that you don't want anybody to see. When you're on your authentic self, you are the same person in every situation. So when I'm a manager, or when I'm a counselor, or when I'm a father, I'm the same guy. There is no difference. I may adjust my behavior, because obviously, if I'm out partying and having a great time, I may use some words that my kids probably shouldn't hear. <laughs> that being said, I fully admit to that fact. Now being authentically here, or rather, when I was wearing the, with the mask, I was the guy who had all the answers. There was never a time I couldn't admit when I didn't have the answers. I was never open to feedback because it might mean that I was wrong. And it would call my entire mask persona into question. When that happened, I'd simply change personas. So I would be arguing with somebody, start realizing that I'm wrong, and very subtly manipulate the conversation to where I was right again. It's quite an art, I can assure you. Today, being authentically here, I am fully willing to admit that I don't have all the answers. In fact, sometimes I'm not even sure what the question is. Also, I am willing to make mistakes. Something that I would never have admitted while wearing the mask. I'm also willing to be wrong. There may even be some of you tonight that completely disagree fundamentally with some of the things I've said. That's okay. In fact, I'm curious to hear your different viewpoints. Now, how do you know when you're wearing a mask or whether you're not just being in a role? Well, there are some keys that can definitely tell you you're wearing a mask. One, the mask is resistant to change. It takes a lot of work and justification to create a mask. If you're resisting something changing or if something is challenging your beliefs and you just will not change that, ask yourself, is that a mask or is that who you really are? And it's okay if it's either one. The mask will want you to go it alone. The ego voice, that little voice inside you, is very independent and that does not want you connecting to anybody because someone out there might say something that proves it wrong. And that is terrifying for the ego voice. So if you find yourself that you need to be alone because you need to be strong right now and independent and, and have it all covered, is that a mask or is that who you are? The mask will also judge others in a negative manner. The mask will make no attempt to be compassionate, empathetic, or in any way have an open mind. And in fact, it will use the things that you judge about the other person to prove that you are not that person. For example, I was the guy that had to have all the answers. So when I would find somebody who didn't have all the answers, oh, well, they were unprepared. They were incompetent. Not worth my time. Absolutely not worth my time. Thus proving that I am worth your time because I have all the answers. And that's what the mask wants you to believe. So now we're to the part of our connected conversations uh, where we actually have the conversation part. So, I have some questions to kind of guide the conversation a little bit. So, what are some of the family rules that you have? What are some of the common masks you might see? And what are some of the masks that we might have? So I hope you have a great conversation with this. I'm gonna give you about, yes? Um, I'm just wondering for number one, if we can mm -hmm. just throw in a few different examples of some family rules. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So for my family, like I said, uh, my family is definitely the family who had to clear your plates all the time. Couldn't talk to yourself because of Cousin Willie and his schizophrenia. There were tiny little rules like that in their subtle. Other rules might be you don't uh, you don't interact with strangers for some reason, or you don't want to get too close to other to, to a certain member of that family. Like everybody has that member of that family that you just you don't want to get too close to because they've done something, or maybe they haven't done something, and that's just what everybody believes. Commonly called the black sheep. I am the black sheep, so I, I know this rule quite well. Is that fairly 
Wonderful. Okay. Is, is there any other questions before we, we start? Okay. So grab somebody next to you and have a good conversation. I will see you in 10 minutes.